Once again, good morning and um, welcome to our webinar um, on open textbook and open access library research. This is Una Daly from the Community College Consortium at the Open Educational Consortium. And um, this is our December webinar um, for uh, our members and our, uh, the rest of the folks out in the open community. And it's my pleasure to have uh, Beck Pitt from the OER Research Hub at the Open University and Nicole Allen uh, from SPARC joining us today. For those of you who might be new to um, our Blackboard Collaborate system, first I'd like to thank the California Community College system that allows us to broadcast these webinars um, and provides uh, technical support. Um, the only thing that you really uh, might want to be aware of is that um, on the left hand side of your uh, window you will see a list of participants and if, you'll, if you scroll up and down you should be able to find yourself in there as well. And there is a little chat window that will either be above the participants list or below and you can use that to communicate during the webinar, um, to ask questions, make comments and um, we'll be doing our best to answer those uh, as we go along, but we'll save some of those, the bigger questions uh, for the end. And now I'd like to ask you uh, where you're from. Um, and there's a couple of ways that you can do this. Um, you can either pick up uh, the little star icon. It's in the toolbar that runs along the middle of your screen. You can pick up one of those icons and drag it over, drag it over to where you're located on the globe, or you can type in um, to the chat window. Yes, thank you, Robin, for uh, sharing in the chat window that you're from Georgia. Um, so I know that uh, usually most of our uh, uh, participants are from um, North America, but um, in fact, uh, our, one of our speakers, Beck Pitt, is uh, from Europe. Uh, she's from uh, the UK, and there we've got a smiley face there. And occasionally we, we do get folks from um, a little further afield as well. Okay, wonderful. Thanks for sharing, everyone. That looks like it's uh, North America and Europe today. But um, to let you know, these webinars are recorded um, and they will be posted um, on YouTube uh, within the week. Um, and so uh, they can be shared more widely with colleagues that you have um, at your institution and, and around the world. So uh, today, um, after a very brief overview on the Community College Consortium for OER, uh, we're going to get right into our uh, research findings with Beck Pitt on open textbooks and librarians. And then um, second, second, we will have Nicole Allen talking about open access and open education and how really um, intertwined these are and, um, and the important role that libraries play in providing um, open educational resources. So I want to give my um, speakers a chance to uh, say hi to the audience and uh, tell us just a little bit about uh, the work that they do. And I, I'm going to start with Beck Pitt. Uh, she's a researcher, senior researcher at the OER Research Hub um, at Open University in the United Kingdom. And um, the OER Research Hub has been underway for uh, several years now and has done some really amazing research. Um, Beck, can you tell us a little bit about the work that Hello, you do hi, there? Hello, hi, Una. Um, hi, everyone. It's great to be here. And thanks so much for inviting me um, to participate in today's webinar. Yeah, as Una said, I'm a research assistant on the OER Research Hub project. I'll be telling you a little bit about the project shortly. Um, but we're looking at the um, impact of open educational resources in, um, across different sectors and in a wide variety of contexts. Um, I'm responsible for um, a lot of the work we do around informal learning and open textbooks and I was also responsible for the delivery of our open research course um, a few months ago with Peer-to-Peer -peer University. Um, I previously worked on a project called um, Bridge to Success which was about um, creating a whole course OER to help students transition into community colleges and, and those, those courses were around maths and personal development. So yeah, that's a little bit about me. And I'm based here in um, as Una mentioned at the Open University in the Institute of Educational Technology. Great. 
thank you, Beck. Um, yeah, so Beck has been not only working with formal learning institutions, as she mentioned, um, but also with informal learning institutions such as the peer-to-peer -peer university. Um, so interesting uh, different aspects of OER. And um, next, uh, Nicole Allen, um, who is the Open Education Director at Spark. Tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing, Nicole. Um, Sure thing. Hi, Una. Um, it's a pleasure to be back on um, another one of the CCC OER webinars. Um, uh, so I, my work at Spark focuses on engaging and supporting the academic and research library community um, on open educational resources and related issues. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Spark, it's an advocacy organization um, that's comprised of member libraries, and we work for more open systems for sharing the results of scholarly research. Um, so I joined Spark about a year and a half ago. Uh, many of you may know me from my previous work with the student clerks, um, working with students to advocate for OER. Um, and with Spark, um, I've kind of shifted my focus to working with libraries. Um, and also, I put a lot of emphasis on, on public policy advocacy um, at, the, at the state and national level here in Washington, D.C. Great. Um, thank, you. thank you so much, Nicole and Beck. We're, we're really thrilled to have you. Um, I just had a couple of comments in the chat window that it's a little muffled on some of the audio. So I'm going to ask both Beck and Nicole to speak just a, a little bit slower when we get to their presentations because I think that helps a little bit with the muffling. So thanks for your patience, everybody. Uh, the technology gods, uh, they either frown or smile. And I hope they'll smile today. All right. Uh, for those of you who are new to the Community College Consortium for OER, we are the, an associate consortium at the Open Ed Consortium. And our primary goal is expanding access to high quality materials um, at the community college. And we do this through supporting uh, faculty choice around materials and providing faculty development opportunities. And these webinars are part of that faculty development outreach uh, that we do. Uh, we have experts such as Beck and Nicole come and talk about um, their work and trends in the, um, in the field. And um, our, 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 at the bottom of all of our goals is improving student success and, um, and and providing um, more access for students. And so we do this through outreach to faculty primarily. Um, we're continuing to grow. Uh, over 250 colleges, um, soon to be in 19 states and provinces. And we'd love to fill in the uh, middle of this map a little bit more. So um, if you're located in those areas, please contact us about our membership. It's very affordable. And now, um, I just want to briefly introduce uh, the topic today. Um, so um, Beck is going to share with us um, the impact on teaching practice um, of using OER. Um, and so she has uh, interviewed and surveyed both faculty and um, librarian. Um, and many, of course, many of our librarians at the community college are faculty as well on the impact of, um, on their teaching practice of using open textbooks. Um, she's also going to share a little bit about some of the student survey responses on how open, open textbooks have impacted student, um, students' experience of learning. And, um, and then uh, we're going to hear about how open educational resources uh, really include open access journals. And I think we're all aware of that, but uh, Spark has been making a really conscious effort to um, link these two together um, so that it's really clear when we're advocating for open access, we're also advocating for open education. And uh, Nicole will also go into a little more detail on how, how the important role of libraries in the curation um, of, of, of resources and access to open research and OER both libraries at institutions, educational institutions, um, but also some of the public uh, libraries uh, that exist as well. And I think specifically she's going to highlight the Public Library of Science, which is a, a wonderful um, institution that does a lot of open access, high quality science journals. Um, and 
I'd like to turn it over now to Beck Pitt to tell us about her work. Great. Thank you so much, Una. It's, it's, again, it's great to be here. So um, just to briefly go over what I'm going to be talking with you guys about, about today, I'll just give you a little bit of an introduction um, about what we do here at the um, OEL Research Hub. And then I'm going to go on and explore some of our um, findings um, to do with open textbooks and our work with OpenStax College um, uh, before going on to um, look at some of our uh, survey findings from work that we did with um, librarians um, around the world, um, kind of based on previous presentations. So um, apologies if, if some of you guys are familiar with um, the material, but I hope it be of interest. OK, so just to start things off, for those of you who aren't familiar with the OER Research Hub, we're um, a Hewlett-funded um, research um, project. We're an open research project. Um, and we're looking at um, the impact of open educational resources around the world in all sectors. So we work, um, as was mentioned in the introduction, um, with uh, organizations and projects and initiatives um, in informal learning, K-12, um, community colleges, and higher education um, as well. We, our research is um, structured by 11 hypotheses. Two of these are kind of central to all the research that we do with our collaborations, and that's to do with student performance and satisfaction, and then also whether or not um, the open part of OER makes a difference. In what ways does it make a difference, and how do people, if and how people use OER differently from other online materials? And as you can see from um, the other hypotheses that are here, we also look at the kind of range of other research questions, including whether or not OER brings financial benefits to institutions and students, and um, whether it widens participation. And these hypotheses enable us to frame our research so that we conduct, can conduct comparative research across different contexts. OK, great. Um, as I mentioned, we're an open research project, so we make all of our research um, available in the open. Um, and you can go to our website, and um, there's a lot of our research that's been blogged. But we also curate OER research um, and include our own on um, our OER impact map, which you can go and check out on the, on the link below, um, oermap.org. And just quickly to show you some of um, the collaborations that we work with. Um, we have an open collaboration model, so we've built up a range of different um, relationships um, with people, amazing um, people doing great work around the world, um, including um, uh, Sia Buller, who um, provide open textbooks in um, South Africa, um, the Flip Learning Network, Raw 4D, um, Solar Foundation, and um, others. OK, so that's great. So. What I'm going to do, I'm going to talk about um, some of these findings from our work with OpenStax College to begin with. So I'll start off with a bit of an overview um, of OpenStax College. Um, then we want to talk about some of the findings. I'm also going to throw in some of our, um, thanks Luna for putting that in the, in the chat box. That's great. That will take you to our website and um, you'll be able to check out more of, uh, about what we do there and some of our research. Um, I'm also going to throw in some of our overall findings. Recently, we've been working on, um, we've run a lot of surveys with our collaborators, and we've kind of created a monster data set, which gives kind of findings um, about OER use um, around the world. And I'll be throwing those in as we go along through this presentation. OK, so just very briefly, um, to give you an overview of OpenStax, to start off with OpenStax, as I'm sure some of you are familiar with um, OpenStax College. Um, they published their first textbook in June um, 2012. Um, there's, I think it's 10 now, actually. 10 open textbooks have been published to date. Um, they're planning a further four open textbooks um, in 2015. And in August, they announced that they're going to be producing textbooks specifically for K-12 as well. Um, and OpenStax I've got about 21 textbooks planned by 2017, and to date they saved students um, over $30 million. And there's a wonderful video that, that's just come out, um, a um, holiday video, where you can see some um, of the educators talking about the impact that OpenStax has had on, 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 on um, cost savings. As I'm sure many of you um, know, um, the impact of uh, on average, total textbook costs are around um, $1,200. Um, and the impact of, of, of the cost of textbooks 
as I know that Barbara's here today, um, uh, when I, I have been fortunate enough to spend time um, talking with her, and as Barbara pointed out, the textbooks actually cross more than tuition for most students. And 63% of respondents in the 2012 Florida Student Textbook Survey reported not having purchased the required textbook because of the high cost. So open textbook providers like OpenStax who provide um, online free resources for people to use are incredibly um, important within this context. Okay, so just to give you a brief idea of, um, this was a survey, basically the survey that I'm going to be talking about briefly. Um, we ran a survey um, both with um, adopters of OpenStax um, materials um, directly targeting um, that group and also um, a newsletter that OpenStax um, produced. So we kind of just let people know about the survey through that. Um, we had nearly 100 responses um, in the end, 77 of which were um, people who told us that they were using um, OpenStax materials. Um, so this gives you a bit of an idea of um, this, this group of respondents that we spoke to. And over 90% of respondents told us that they had adopted um, open educational resources to fit their needs, um, which is an amazingly high number um, when you think about um, people who, yes, excuse me, um, when you think that there's often a, maybe a perception that people don't adopt and um, remix OER, um, we found that there's an incredibly high number of people, particularly in this group of um, respondents, that do um, adopt open educational resources. Overall, our findings um, to date with educators um, indicate about 86% of educators that we spoke to as part of this um, project have adopted OER in some way. And we're kind of looking now more at what we mean by that question of, of, of um, that idea of adapting. Just also briefly to note that um, with this group of respondents, with our um, OpenStax educators, when we surveyed them last year, we found that um, finding resources of sufficiently high quality was the top challenge most faced by educators when using OER. Um, um, that was also one of the top three challenges across the board um, for educators that we, we, we surveyed as part of this project. Okay, so just briefly to move on to um, talk about the impact on educators and students. Um, we, asked, um, we asked educators um, a range of different questions about um, what kind of open educational resources they used, but then also about um, um, the financial benefits, whether there were financial benefits to themselves and their students, and also whether they um, questions about student performance and satisfaction. So I'm going to include some of those in that, but you can read um, the results in more depth um, in a series of blog posts um, that we published, um, I think it was end of June, early July time. Um, we had a kind of open textbook research week, and there's a lot of the posts and um, interviews available on our website there. Okay, so just very quickly. Um, one of the questions that we were kind of interested in asking um, people was whether or not um, using OpenStax um, college textbooks is impacted on their own teaching practice. So here's a range of kind of um, thoughts um, and, and people's experiences um, that we gathered as part of the, the survey. So you can see that people talk about, for example, um, the quote on the um, left-hand side, people, um, this respondent is talking about the kind of collective um, approach to compiling um, additional resources. Um, others kind of talk about the fact that using a resource, an OER like OpenStax textbooks, um, enables them to, to kind of be more creative and create more um, material that's tailored for their own for, for their um, for their own students. Um, and this kind of um, relates um, is, is illustrated further by the fact that we also asked people in the survey about to what extent they agreed um, with a number of different statements about using, using um, OER, such as OpenStax, in the classroom. And over 67% of um, the people that we surveyed told us that this allowed them to better accommodate diverse learners' needs. Um, it's also worth noting here that um, the top um, four responses here um, to this uh, this question of the same 
as for the overall um, educators that we surveyed um, as part of, of, of our research. So around 44% 40, 40, 40 of um, educators that we surveyed as part of this project um, told us that OER allowed them to better accommodate diverse learners' needs. That's around 850 people. Okay, to move on just quickly, um, just to briefly remark on um, the ways in which OpenStax um, has impacted on um, people's students, there was a range of kind of responses um, to this question. I kind of um, this gives you a kind of snapshot. Of course, there's the um, and one of the key. Um, impact on students that we picked up on um, was that a number of people kind of talked about students being able to access resources um, before and after a class. They don't have to sell the textbook on when they finish their class. They don't need to wait for funding, financial aid to kind of come through um, or wait for students to purchase textbooks. As somebody says on the, on the top um, left hand corner here, it's a great excuse to find tools. Students have access whenever. Um, wherever and whenever they need it. Um, others kind of told us about um, student cost savings um, that were made and um, on average there was about um, savings of about $208 per student. We, we also carried out a, a survey of students um, at the same time as surveying educators last year and um, students that told us how much they were, they were saving with OpenStax, on average it was about $208. Um, um, so just to give you an idea of cost savings um, from a student perspective, but I think that that quote in the top left there um, kind of puts into perspective, um, you know, a student having to work 15 hours for each book that they had to buy. Um, as also you can see, there's other other educators reported their um, uh, enrollment increasing. As they say, perhaps they're not sure to the with it being to do with a textbook, but also um, others saying, well, actually, you know, we've got a great up-to-date text, um, whereas otherwise we would be forced to purchase um, older kind of um, kind of textbooks. Um, and there was quite an interesting paper um, that I was reading about um, e e-books. Um, there's a there's a great piece um, in Educational Researcher by David Wiley, John Hilton, and others, which talks about um, the need to kind of purchase um, online books each year. So the cost um, ends up being more over the same period of use that you would have had of a hard copy book, I think it's around a seven year period. So it's very interesting kind of um, to think about the cost implications as well. Okay, here's some thoughts from our students as well. So we had um, uh, feedback on the ways in which open textbooks have impacted on students. People kind of remarked on a number of different things, including not having to carry so many books, but also their grades increasing um, and the ability to kind of participate um, and access um, the education that they needed. As one student said on the right, um, they went, it enabled them to develop knowledge because easily in areas where um, they wouldn't have otherwise been able to because they wouldn't have been able to um, afford to, to purchase a textbook. And almost 80% of um, the students that we surveyed um, last year um, thought they'd save money by using um, OpenStax materials. Um, and these are students using the materials in different contexts. So some of them were informal learners um, and more formal learners in different um, context. Okay, great. And just to finish um, uh, with the OpenStax um, section of um, this presentation, I just wanted to end on a kind of um, reflecting on, we asked people about, um, as a result of using OpenStax materials, whether they were more or likely to do um, a number of different things. Um, and I just wanted to pick up on four things here. The first is that um, just over 96% of people um, said they were more likely to recommend OpenStax textbooks to fellow um, educators as a result of using them. Than, so there's a kind of sense in which people are um, spreading the word about um, or are more willing to, to kind of 
talk and engage with people and talk with them about open education resources. I think this is particularly the case when you look at the fact that 80% of people um, told us that they're more likely to discuss using open specs materials with their institutions administrators and I think that kind of bodes um, very well in terms of um, spreading the word about OER and perhaps kind of indicating a more advocacy um, uh, approach. Um, it's also interesting that nearly 80% of people also told us they were more likely to use other OER for teaching. So it was kind of um, seems to be that once you start using OER, this positive experience or the experiences that people were having makes it more likely that they're going to use this type of resource in the future. Okay, great. So I don't know if anyone's got any questions. Um, I'm going to move on just... Okay, I don't think there's anything in the chat box to pick up at this moment, but there'll be time um, at the end. So just moving on to talk um, about the work that we did with um, another collaboration. This was um, this project, uh, this collaboration kind of came about because we have an open collaboration model and I met um, Eleni and um, Nancy who worked with me on the slides that you're um, about to see on the survey that we ran. Um, and Nancy and Eleni work um, are involved in Project Copilot, which are a group of um, librarians seeking to promote um, and share um, a number of OERs which were created as part of the Delilah project. And um, our work with Copilot concentrated um, on a number of different questions, but they had particular um, interest in um, the creation and sharing of OER um, and um, closing training gaps as well. So it, some of our questions were kind of around, um, around this uh, and were kind of building on some of the previous research that's been done on um, librarians and, and OER, for example, the Taylor and Sanchez um, work in 2013. So we had around just over 300 responses to these surveys. We ran one with um, co-pilot um, uh, people who were um, connected to the co-pilot project in some way, but we also had a, a survey that kind of went out, um, was kind of in the wild, as it were, um, out on email and, um, and uh, sorry, Twitter and so on. Um, so we, out of our respondents, um, about kind of whittled it down to around 218 um, valid responses. Um, over 80% of our respondents were female, and most of them came from um, the US and the UK. Um, and around 85% um, of respondents uh, reported having a postgraduate qualification, just to give you an idea of, um, of um, this group of respondents. Oops. Okay, so I'm very conscious of time. I need to, um, I'll just, again, this kind of gives you an idea. So nearly 40% of our respondents told us they'd adapted OER to um, fit their needs. Um, and just nearly a third of respondents were created OER for studying and teaching. Again, as you can see in the bottom um, left-hand box, the top three challenges faced by people include um, finding resources that are sufficiently um, high quality um, and the relevance of resources um, to, to, people's, um, to people's needs. Um, it's also worth noting, I've just put here, that people would be more likely um, to select a particular resource if it's been created or uploaded by a trusted institution or person. Um, which is, a, is, is particularly um, interesting. And also interesting is the fact that this group of people um, also said that CC licensing was very important when they were searching um, for resources. Um, so we had, in our overall um, kind of monster survey, um, monster data set, um, where we, we kind of put together all of our survey sort of findings, just over a third of educators um, we surveyed told us that Creative Commons, um, some, a resource having Creative Commons licensing um, was important, whereas just under 70% of the librarians that we, we surveyed, uh, or this group of librarians, told us that that was important. Um, I just wanted very briefly um, to talk a bit about um, the findings that we had around um, 
CC licensing. So just to put that into context, um, just over 70% of the people we surveyed in this research um, had seen the Creative Commons license and knew what it means. So what we did is we showed people um, the license that you can see in the middle of the screen and told them to kind of tell us whether or not it was familiar to them. Um, around 55% of the educators we surveyed as part of the project um, uh, told us they were familiar with the um, the CC um, logo, whereas a much higher percentage of um, librarians that we surveyed are familiar. And it's kind of interesting to look at that. This, this um, slide is kind of examining um, that in relation to people who publish um, uh, resources on, on an open license. So you can see that nearly 90, just under 90% of people um, told us they've seen the CC license. Um, and obviously it's quite a small um, number of people and we need to do some more research around this. But I kind of think looking at um, the relationship between people's practices um, and familiarity with things like open licensing is, is a kind of interesting um, thing to look at here. Okay. Thanks for posting that, Mia. That's great. Okay. So... Okay, just very quickly to um, look here. Again, we kind of asked um, people um, to tell us a bit more about um, as a result of using open educational resources, um, if it had any impact on um, on uh, a range of different um, behaviours. Um, and as you can see, almost 70% of um, Librarians that we surveyed make use of a wider range of multimedia. People also telling us that they had improved um, ICT skills and a more up-to-date knowledge of their subject area. Um, so it seems as if OER, or you could kind of claim, um, or look to claiming or building up a claim around that OER is helping people to um, enhance their skills and that there's a kind of sense in which the, the OER that people are um, encountering is also of, of um, a high quality in order to have this kind of um, impact on people's um, understanding and knowledge of, of the subject areas that they, they're working. So just to end, um, okay, I'm conscious of time. Una, is it, should I wrap up shortly? Um, with us? Um, yeah, we should finish up in the next couple of minutes. Thanks, Beck. Okay, that, that's great. No worries. Okay, so I'm just going to skip over these slides. Um, very quickly, um, because they're available on the OER research hub slide share, and obviously the presentation will be available um, afterwards as well. So these slides are kind of talking a bit about um, if respondents have kind of created OER, we kind of ask them how they shared the OER, they create and measure impact. So the, the next couple of slides are kind of talking about that and the difficulties of, of people um, understanding what, um, and as somebody says at the bottom, an adequate measure of impact is. Um, so we kind of look at ways different people um, are sharing open educational resources and then also how people um, measure measure the impact. So they told us that they're measuring the impact of those resources. Finally, this is just to kind of reflect on um, policies that people thought they were, that, that um, they thought would help to kind of make people um, help them to become more open. Um, some people talked about recognition for the kind of OERs that they were creating. Other people talked about um, the skills that um, they felt that they needed in order to be able to uh, create um, um, and remix um, open educational resources. And then others talked about um, the need for policies around licensing and policies in their, in their institutions. So just to conclude, um, there's obviously some questions around um, measuring impact um, and understanding quality, um, to in what we've been doing with the librarians. Um, my colleague, um, our, our collaborators, um, are kind of reflecting on the way in which a lot of the, li the librarians that, that we talk to um, in the, the work, in our survey work, um, you know, people aren't necessarily people are kind of working in silos and that's kind of reflected as well in the situation for many, many educators. In terms of our um, 
work on open textbooks. Um, we're doing further work with OpenStax College and some case studies at the moment, and then also surveying people again. So we should have more um, data around um, uses of open textbooks um, uh, shortly. We're also doing a great uh, survey um, with BC Campus Open Textbooks Project at the moment in British Columbia. And there's also some um, work that we've been doing with Siavula in South Africa um, as well. So those, those, those results are available. There's a, ser a series of um, blog posts I wrote with Medan around that, which contextualize those, those findings if you're particularly interested in that. Um, so yeah, just to end on that, um, if you wanted to check out our overall findings, that's wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> There's a link in the chat box um, to our evidence report. And um, yeah, we'd love to um, hear from you and your, um, your uh, examples of impact and what you think about our work. Thank you ever so much. Great. Thank you so much, Beck. Uh, we really appreciate you joining us. Uh, Beck is uh, joining us from England today. And of course, we've, uh, we've taken up her evening uh, time. So really appreciate that and, and the overview that you gave us about both student faculty and librarians and also institutions and how they're feeling about OER. Um, so grab the links in the chat window um, if you want further information. And now I would like to turn this over to Nicole Allen. Uh, Thanks so much, Una. Um, and uh, thank you, Beck. It was a, a really stimulating presentation. Um, and I'm excited about the work that you guys have been doing. Um, so my talk here today is going to focus on uh, connecting the dots between uh, open access to research uh, in open education. So just sort of taking a step back um, to talk about research more broadly um, and how that's important in the context of open education um, and how uh, uh, access to the results of, of cutting edge research can be important educational tools. So, um, the, uh, the open access movement um, and the open educational resources movement um, are, are really kind of operate and seen as two distinct movements. Um, and actually, SPARC uh, originally started out focusing only on open access to the results of scholarly research. Um, for, for over a decade, that was our focus. Um, but recently, we branched out to include open access to all uh, outputs of the research project process, which includes both the data that underlies the research uh, that gets published, um, and also the educational materials and tools that arise from that research um, and, and actually communicate the findings of it, the findings of centuries of, of human knowledge and discovery um, to the next generation of scholars and researchers through you know, textbooks and courses and, and everything we teach with. Um, so we're starting to see these two movements kind of converge in a way. Um, so my goal here today is, is to give you a brief introduction to the open access movement and hopefully explain how, how this can be relevant to the work you're doing on campus to advance uh, open educational resources. So we see the graph a lot. Um, I, I know for those of you who have seen me present on OER, I, I use a graph showing the rising cost of textbooks. Um, and this is actually not that graph, but it's a graph uh, about the cost of serials, which uh, is a word used to refer to, to scholarly journals that, that libraries pay. And as you can see, over um, just a couple of decades, uh, how much money uh, libraries were spending on uh, access to journals that published the latest research uh, increased over 400%, uh, which is a similar problem to what we're <laughs> you know, seeing in the textbook market. And when you look at the cost of even just individual journals, whoops, uh, you'll, you'll see in some fields the average cost of a journal like in, in chemistry is $4,000 to subscribe to that journal for one year. These journals contain papers about the latest research being conducted in chemistry. Um, so it's an important thing for, for, for students and faculty to have access to on campus. Um, and this is especially important, and you hear about it a lot in the context of research institutions, you know, like Harvard and the UCs. Um, because uh, you know the faculty and students that are conducting research absolutely have 
to have access to this information. But it's also really important um, for students more broadly to have access to the latest information in their fields um, uh, to make sure that they can enrich their own educational experience and keep their knowledge up to date. Um, but it's gotten to the point where even the wealthiest institutions like, like Harvard um, can't afford to, to purchase subscriptions um, to all of the journals that their faculty want. Um, and uh, uh, I, I don't have any statistics on this, but my sense is that when um, we're talking about community colleges and, and really teaching-focused institutions, large teaching-focused institutions, um, it's just not possible to afford access to journals. Um, so it's something that we're really missing out on um, at, in a lot of places. So I think um, uh, uh, with, um, I mean, that covers the, the cost of research from a library perspective. But this is also something that students um, and individual educators experience um, in their own lives. Of course, uh, we all know what's happening with the price of textbooks. Um, I actually just came across, this is the most popular calculus textbook in the country. Um, the price has, has risen to over $300 um, for a bundle containing this book at some institutions. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, we're familiar with talking about the burden of instructional material costs in, in terms of textbooks, but it's actually the case that um, the cost of research articles impact individual students as well. Um, this is just one example of a course pack that a faculty member assembled out of research articles that have been published in these journals. And the price of these course tasks <coughs> excuse me, um, can get up over $100. In some cases, I've seen prices as high as, as $400. Because each of the individual articles, the publisher of that, of that article is going to charge a fee. Um, so uh, uh, it's, it's, there is a parallel issue that impacts students. And then just taking a step even farther back is something that um, everybody in, in the audience has probably experienced at some point. I know I remember experiencing this when I was a student. But you go to Google, and you Google a topic that you're researching. Whether you're writing a paper about it or, or just interested in it. Um, and some links will pop up to uh, articles that seem to talk just about what you're looking for in this case. Um, this is an article that was just published um, about uh, uh, open textbooks in Utah that I tried to get access to um, about a month ago, uh, but couldn't because when I went to the website I, uh, and clicked to download the article, I got hit with a paywall um, that says that I have to pay $30 to read this one article. And that's crazy because it's just one article, and I don't even know if the information in the article uh, is what I'm looking for. So what I did was move on because um, I knew the authors were actually going to make this article open access. But you know, think about this. This is what your students are experiencing. Um, they suddenly find information that could be useful for their education, but they can't get access to it because it's really expensive. Um, so I, I think <laughs> one of the interesting things that's happened is, uh, you know, with textbooks, students are, um, you know, buying and selling these books and, and sharing copies with their friends or, you know, just not buying the textbook because it's so expensive. One of the interesting things that has happened in the, the journal and, and article space is that there's actually a hashtag on Twitter <laughs> where students can um, and, and researchers post a uh, link to the article they're looking for and, and use this hashtag and somebody who has access to that at another institution that can subscribe to the journal sends a copy to them. Uh, probably not the most legal way to do it, but, um, you know, it's just really a, a, a signal that the system is, is that broken, um, that students and researchers are forced uh, to go through alternate means to get access to materials. So. Um, I think that just when you look at it, what's happening with, with course materials and what's happening with research, um, a message I often talk about is that it, it, students can't learn from materials they can't afford. And I think that's what's happening in both of these spaces. And that's why um, both open educational resources and open access have kind of converged into this idea of openness as a solution. So um, in, in the research space, when we think about the opportunity here, so um, the research that's being conducted right now is incredibly valuable. Um, 
but the question is, does our system for distributing it share our values as educational institutions? Um, and the answer is no. Uh, I mean, right now, the authors of these articles write them for free. Um, the peer reviewers peer review them for free. And then the traditional journal publishers package up all of these great articles about research and then sell them back to the institutions where a lot of that research has been conducted and leave an entire swath of the educational community in the entire world without access to the information. Um, and that's not even to mention that about 80% <clears throat> of research out there is publicly funded. So we, the taxpayers, are actually paying for this research, and yet we don't have access to them. You know, we invest heavily in, in public institutions of higher education to make sure that those students get an up-to-date education, but they don't have access to the research and, and all of the newest information that, that our taxpayer dollars have funded. Um, so that's where we come to this idea of open access, um, which uh, we define as the free, immediate, online access to scientific and scholarly articles with the right to fully use those articles in the digital environment. So um, those of you that are familiar with the Hewlett Foundation's definition of open educational resources as um, uh, either in the public domain uh, or released under an open intellectual property license that allows their free use and repurposing by others. It has those two elements. So one is free, uh, meaning no cost and no barriers. And the second component is those reuse rights or open license. Um, and in the open education space, we typically refer to the 5R framework, uh, reuse, revise, remix, redistribute, retain, um, to define what is OER, what permissions uh, make something OER. And in open access, we actually take a, a stricter definition. Um, it's actually the uh, Creative Commons attribution only license is um, the only true open access license. And it's really the only, since there's no expectation of payment for authors, really we want to set the bar really high that uh, attribution be the, the only requirement. Um, attached to research articles. So there are two pathways for making materials open access. Um, so the first is to simply publish uh, a, a research article in a journal that allows the article to be open access, so released under a Creative Commons attribution license. Um, and there are actually over 10,000 journals out there right, there right now that do that um, and allow that for their authors. Uh, which has exploded, um, uh, you know, just over a decade ago, there was virtually none. Um, so one great example is PLOS, the Public Library of Science, and actually the last time that um, CCC OER invited me to speak at, at one of your webinars, um, uh, somebody from PLOS was uh, uh, one of the co-speakers. Um, but uh, you can go online right now to PLOS and download um, and, and read uh, hundreds of thousands of scientific papers um, that are all under Creative Commons attribution license. And all of that material is available for use in the classroom. Um, and then the second, so the first path is publishing uh, articles as open access. And then the second pathway um, is to publish uh, a paper in, in basically any journal and then archive a copy of it. So take a copy of it and either post it on your own website or put it into a repository. Um, uh, at a library that makes it available to the public. Um, and there are actually over 2,000 repositories that support um, sharing research articles. Um, and it's interesting, uh, actually a, a lot of publishers now allow authors of research articles to do this. Um, so it's not always that they can share the um, final copy, but their preprint copies of what they submitted to the publisher. Um, about 72% of publishers right now um, actually allows some form of, of self-archiving, so sharing the paper you've published. Um, and this is something where there's a lot of action in the policy space. Uh, so there, there are over 200 institutions uh, where the faculty members have agreed that when we publish research, um, we need to have the right uh, to uh, post that publicly. Um, and the University of California actually just adopted one of those policies, which is really, really exciting and groundbreaking. 
Um, and then also in, in the public policy space, uh, I, I said before that about 80% of research is publicly funded. If we just get the people that are funding research to make open publication of the results a condition of the funding, um, you know, it takes out some of the questions about sustainability and, and how to support open access publishing. Um, and the, uh, in the U.S., the National Institute of Health actually um, already has a policy that requires um, uh, uh, researchers to share their results. Um, and that's something that Spark is working very hard to expand. Um, so many institutions actually have those repositories for their faculty members to share research, um, but there are also, uh, for, for faculty members or researchers at institutions without that, um, there are subject-specific repositories. Online, one example for physics is archive.org, um, where you can put copies of your article and make them available for people to find. Um, you know, of course, you can just post it on your website, but um, it's, it's best to put it in a place where other people can find it. So um, I want to wrap up and spend the rest of the time I have um, <clears throat> just giving a couple of illustrations of the kind of impact um, that open access to research results can have. Um, so some of you may have heard on the news the story of Jack Andraka, who's a six or was a 16-year-old kid um, who won the Intel Science Fair because he invented um, a really revolutionary um, test diagnostic for uh, pancreatic cancer. A uh, 16 year old a high school kid who was you know doing um, a, a high level scientific research <laughs> um, basically out of his bedroom and uh, uh, he says that the way that he was able to get access to that information was through Google um, and because a lot of the information from the national research funded from the National Institutes of Health is available open access he was able to get enough information to put together this really revolutionary cure. And of course, you know, we're talking about a high school student, but this is the, the level of access that community college students have, um, and students in institutions where the library can't afford subscriptions to these journals. Um, so expanding the amount of knowledge that is out there um, and making that available to the entire world. How many more Jack and Drakas are out there? How many are sitting in your classroom um, if they had access to more research? Um, so another illustration is actually the, the benefits for authors. Um, so this is, of course, something we talk about a lot with OER, so why would an author want to publish uh, open educational resources? Um, and in the open access space, uh, really the driving force behind publishing is this idea of citations um, and, and making sure that your scholarship is widely um, read and, and seen. Um, and uh, this graph shows uh, actually um, uh, an institution that adopted a policy, um, an open access policy, the citation rate of a mid-career researcher actually shot up after they adopted the policy because more people could read the research. Um, and it only drops off at the end because um, it's partially your data. Um, and then the final illustration is the University of Minnesota um, they have a really cool project, and, and a couple of other institutions are doing this too, um, but it's a digital uh, course pack pilot um, where they actually use the library's uh, 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 reserves to create course packs. And they significantly reduce the cost for students because students aren't paying through the bookstore and through the library. And it's, been, it's given them an opportunity to work with faculty to actually identify open access articles that students don't have to pay for to get access to. Um, so you don't get those $400 course packs. Um, and just by way of closing, I want to uh, just mention that um, uh, uh, the I idea of connecting all of these movements, so open access, open education, open data, um, is something that is really intuitive uh, to the next generation, so students and early career researchers. And this is past month, Spark hosted a meeting in Washington, D.C. called OpenCon, um, where we brought in about 150 students and early career researchers from over 40 countries. Um, and it just became really apparent that, um, you know, even though these movements have kind of evolved separately um, and have their separate messages, uh, at the end of the day, um, it, it really, um, um, uh, they have so many similarities. And if we can think about how to make the work that we're doing consistent with each other, 
and um, uh, communicate similar messages and use the opportunities that we have every day when advocating for OER to also advocate for open access and vice versa. Um, we can advance the movements as they're connected all together. Um, so uh, I think, you know, I think I'll just leave it at that. Um, I think uh, the the just the takeaway from here is just think about how we can how can how can we advance our systems of sharing knowledge towards openness in all of its forms. So we are back to you. All right, great. Um, thank you so much, uh, Nicole, for uh, sharing that um, and giving us that wide overview of what's happened in the last 10 or 15 years around open access and how it's such a key piece to those of us who are involved in open educational resources as well. Um, at this time, um, I want to say happy holidays from all of us at CCC OER to you. And we'll see you in January. And I want to open this up to questions. And uh, if you have um, access to a microphone, you can click on the talk button. and. Um, ask a question or you can pop a question into the chat window. And I, so far I don't, I haven't, I haven't seen any questions. So please do uh, take this opportunity to ask both uh, Beck and Nicole uh, questions. Um, well, I haven't seen any questions thus far. Um, <laughs> oh, Harriet's asked a question for you, Nicole, there. Will OpenCon be a yearly event? It will indeed. Um, we haven't announced the date or location of OpenCon 2015, um, but it's definitely in the planning stage. And um, the uh, uh, one thing to just think about is that one option um, that we make available um, uh, primarily to SCOC members, but to all um, to all institutions, is to actually sponsor a student to go. Um, there's an application process, of course. Um, we we actually had over 2,000 students from uh, across the world apply to come to OpenCon, and we're only ultimately able to select about 4% of them to come. Um, but uh, we do um, have sponsorship opportunities where, if you want to send a student from your institution, you may consider doing that. Great, wonderful. And um, Nicole, you do a fair amount of advocacy work as well. Um, in fact, I think today you may be um, doing some advocacy work because I know that uh, she, uh, Nicole told me earlier that she was leaving from an all-day meeting um, on Capitol Hill just to come and talk with us. So we really appreciate that. Um, so in terms of advocacy around OER and open access, anything coming up um, in the short term that we should be aware of? Well, so in, here, here in the U.S., um, the, as, as you all know, we just had an election. Uh, Congress is going to look really different next year. Um, but I think one of the really interesting things is that on open access, we've been able to get a lot of bipartisan traction, which is a good thing because it's an issue that appeals to everybody um, on, the, on uh, the more conservative side of things. Um, it's about taxpayer access to taxpayer-funded materials. Um, on the more liberal side of things, it's about um, uh, justice and access to information. So I think that we are going to see in, in kind of the tense policy environment that we're likely to have. This is an issue that um, one of the rare issues where um, both sides of the aisle can work together. And then I'll also just say that um, you know all eyes are going to be on the 2016 presidential election, and the idea of college affordability is, is going to be a big one. Um, so I think we do have an opportunity there to make sure that OER um, and open access and, and open issues in general um, are, are put on the table. Um, and that's, that's certainly something that um, we all should be thinking about as presidential candidates come to your, uh, to come to your campuses. Great. Thank you for that, <clears throat> Nicole. Um, Jean has a question here, and I'm going to direct this to Beck. Uh, she asks, um, do you know of any work being done to have OER count towards tenure and promotion for faculty? And I wonder, um, Beck, if you have run into any of that uh, in your surveying of um, faculty or administrators. 
And thanks for the question. That's great. That's very interesting. Um, no, um, we haven't at present. Uh, we're looking. Um, that's an interesting question. I think I'm, I'm be making a note of it as um, something that maybe um, would be something that we could look at in our future research. But no, unfortunately, at present we haven't, as far as I'm aware, um, uh, looked into that in any depth. So sorry, Jean. Um, but thanks for the question. Yes. Yeah, thanks for the question, Jean. Um, it's, I hear it talked about quite a bit. I haven't heard of any official policy um, in this area, but it's, it, is, it has been identified as, as mm -hmm. an issue. Um, Cole, do you have anything you'd like to share in that area? We may have lost Nicole. I know that has to get back to her meeting. I, so thank you for the question, Jean, and it's a great one. Um, I, I, I think we're going to close with the last question here from Constance, and she asks, which ones of the academic institutions have made the most progress as far as open textbooks? And I'm assuming you mean adopting and using open textbooks, um, Constance, so that um, it has the maximum impact for students um, as well as faculty. And I. Um, actually, that would be a great number to ask Nicole as well, because I know she's done a lot of um, numbers in this area. Um, while we're waiting for Nicole, if she's coming back, um, I will let you know that um, in working on the California Open Textbook Project this year, um, which we, we call the library Cool for Ed, um, we have found that colleges um, have adopted at a higher rate. Um, and actually, I, I'm not absolutely sure that it's a higher rate. Um, simply within California, we have many more community colleges, the two-year colleges, than we have universities and state universities. And so overall, we see more adoptions at the community colleges. Of course, we have many more students there as well, and so the impact is higher. Um, and so I'm certainly open to anyone else who would like to share what's happening um, outside of the colleges um, on open adoption. Go ahead. Una, it's Nicole. Do you want me to jump in? Sure. Yeah, please do. Um, yeah, so just a couple of, of things from, from my perspective. Um, so the, when, when we look at like savings numbers and, and who's actually saved students the most, the most money on textbooks, um, I'd look to Washington State, um, their open course library program across those, I think, 34 community and school colleges there. They're some of the leaders. Um, I think Tidewater Community College in Virginia with the Z degree, um, uh, their project hasn't been um, in effect for very long. But um, as with anything, the savings will grow over time. Um, and then another trend that we're seeing in some of the most successful programs in, in advancing OER adoption are actually based in the library. Um, so I just want to point to UMass Amherst's Open Education Initiative has saved students uh, over $1.5 million uh, by working with faculty to replace expensive textbooks with um, OER and other library-based materials. Okay. Um, yeah, so high level. All right couple of examples. Yeah, yeah. And we certainly have seen lots of um, savings, particularly in the math and statistics area, um, with open textbooks of long standing, um, such as collaborative statistics and, and the wonderful work that's being done in the Maricopa district um, around um, open math um, curriculum. And they're using that throughout their district. And, um, and it's being used elsewhere now as well. So. Uh, yeah, lots of lots of exciting stuff, um, and it, it, I guess we do need a real uh, a real report on that sometime. Um, that's uh, that's written up. So thank you everyone uh, for joining us today, and thank you once again to our wonderful presenters Beck Pitt and Nicole Allen. And we're looking forward to seeing you guys in January uh, when we're back with a, a, another set of webinars. Happy holidays to everyone, and um, thanks so much, Una. Yeah, thanks.